Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul, like a winged child with its mother. Like a winged child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Wow, those are two of my favorite psalms in the Bible. I just want to do a hearty like Selah. Let's just ponder them and think about them. So we will in a minute. But sometimes people ask me what the V here stands. See the V up here on the board? It stands for victory. And O here stands for overcoming. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to wear this shirt to honor my son-in-law, Riley, and and, and Buddy A. Cup. Buddy, that's a beautiful sweater you have on today. And uh, there he is. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, just to be honest with all of you, I am, I am officially a platypus. Uh, love, uh, I love the, the Beavs baseball. And I was actually watching the Beavs uh, football uh, throughout the year, and they really, really have improved. So it was, it was a, a fun Civil War, <laughs> and the nachos that Buddy made were awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So what you should have done is probably paint your sweater with the nachos sauce, and then it would cover up all of the, the blasphemy that you have to wear, too. Okay. <laughs> wow. Well, today we're going to be uh, tackling the subject of uh, some songs or psalms of hope. Uh, how many of you know that people need hope in this life? We need hope. Uh, they've, they've done a study about people who die at sea. Let, let's say a sailboat capsizes or someone is in a vessel that's distressed. And, and so maybe a person or two are in a lifeboat. And typically, they'll die within three days. And it was a real mystery. Why would someone literally die in three days? And so they did various tests. They found out that if you hang on, that the tides will take you to a continent somewhere. You'll either blow back to the West Coast or you'll end up in, in Japan or an island. But con the, con you know, the... Um, the currents will take someone somewhere, and that you can actually, if you sip very lightly, even salt water, it'll keep you alive. If you gulp it, it'll kill you. But why do people who might even have some water, why do they die within three days? And the answer is, they lose hope, is what the studies concluded. They just look around and they say, this is so hopeless, I'm going to die, and they just die. Well, how many of you know the Lord is the great hope giver that we have? He's, we have hope of eternal life. We have hope of, of rescue. And we have hope of a, of a better tomorrow. Isn't that even part of Thanksgiving is, is we say thank you for what, for what you've done for us thus far. And we have faith that you're gonna, going to continue what you've been doing in bringing good things into our life and letting us grow up into your image and likeness. And we have hope. I don't know about you, but I'm really glad to be a Christian today and have my hope in Jesus Christ. How many of you can say, me too? I'm in there. Well, one of the uh, beautiful hikes that you can take here in Southern Oregon is, is, is about a nine-mile round, round-trip hike called Mount McLaughlin. It's other name for those that grew up in the valley. It was Mount Pitt. 
When you understand how difficult it is, I, it, it, when, I'm, when I'm planning on going, it's Mount McLaughlin. When, I, when I'm climbing it, it's Mount Pitt. Because it is considered, even by the Forest Service, uh, a difficult climb. And, and one of the things about it is, as you, you go and you start the trail and you get up to the Pacific Crest Trail, it's like no biggie. Then you, then you begin to climb and ascend, and, and, uh, and, it's, and it's a lava base mountain, and so you're, you know, you're having to be careful your boots, they kind of go sideways, and so you progress up until you get to uh, the um, timber line, and then you see a summit. When you climb to the summit, you're going, woo, I'm almost here. That summit has a nickname, Heartbreak Ridge, <laughs> because it's a false summit. You get up on it, and you go, yeah, I'm on top of this this spur, but there's mountain still ahead. And it's even steeper. And it's even more challenging. And then you have a gut check, literally. You want to see if you have any guts left. And, uh, and uh, the, the two times I climbed it, I didn't realize I, I had heart trouble. And so the first time I, I crawled up with Gino praying for me, offering to carry me, and I actually made the summit. Making the summit, it was gorgeous. And I didn't realize I was needing heart work and stents and all that. Second time I went up, still I hadn't had any of that done. And I, I stopped because I knew how difficult that last bit was. Heartbreak Ridge. You know, a lot of people think that coming to Jesus, that everything is just going to be peachy keen. You know, and sometimes people evangelize with, uh, with a, a real false uh, proclamation. Hey, come to Jesus and all your problems are going to be over. No, no, some of them are. Like going to hell, I find problematic. Yeah. <laughs> that one's cured by coming to Jesus. But not having to work on the road, meaning live this life and wear out my tires because roads chew up tires. We've all replaced tires, and, and so we call living life as where the rubber meets the road. And in our life, we find out there's resistance, and there's things that we face, whether it's physical challenges, maybe illness. It's so neat seeing Brittany. She's riding the scooter. That's, that's my kickboard. She ran, and they improved it. They put a horn on there. So, so if you see her honking, just let her pass. Because <laughs> there she is. There we go. Yeah. So we have physical challenges, right? And, and, and Wendy, Wendy's probably watching on, on live stream, and, and Kim, and, and you have physical challenges. And well, I'm a Christian, should I have anything that's, that's in my path? I want, to, I want to not have heartbreak ridge in my life. I want to just be at the top, or better yet, my idea is, Lord, grant me so much money that my friends who have helicopters drive me to the summit and put me there with picnic basket. But it's probably not going to happen. They'll tell me I'm too fat and I need to walk it. But the apostles in Jesus' teachings were straightforward about the fact that opposition, trial, and difficulties were part of the believer's experience. Drats, who wants that? Hey, I'm coming to Jesus so I can experience trials, opposition, tribulation, etc. It was anticipated and prepared for with a promise of, watch this, eventual victory and triumph. Some quick examples from the New Testament so that we can realize that old and new are in agreement on the major themes of the Bible. The, the Bible doesn't just switch courses and suddenly... Everything is completely different, okay? And so we're going to find out this idea that, that we have trouble in this life. As we look at Psalms of Hope, we're going to look at some scriptures from the New Testament. So quoting Paul from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, he said, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. How many of you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. Could you raise your hand? Wow, you're better than the first service. There's like eight people raised their hand. I said, well, the altar call is going to be exciting here. You know, <laughs> we all desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, right? 
But that's why we're here in the house of the Lord. We want to have encouragement and strength, prayers, some worship, and all that good stuff so that we can go and live godly in Christ Jesus. And then here's nasty Paul, and he's just saying that, that here's a guarantee. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. No, some chapters I don't want to quote. Like this one. But here's a promise for me. You, Steve Schmelzer, if you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. Good news, it has happened. Worse news, it probably will still. Okay, that's the words of Paul. How about Jesus? How many of you think Jesus is the number one expert on Jesus? And he said this, quoting himself, John 16, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Wow. So Jesus... Paul's saying we have persecution. Jesus is saying we have tribulation. Well, what did Peter have to add to it? In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 through 13, he said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the, the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Isn't that exactly how you feel when you suddenly find yourself in a trial? I find myself in a fiery trial. I go, wow, this is weird. It's like a fiery trial. This is sure strange. And then I read Peter, don't think it's strange, but it seems strange. Don't think it's strange. It seems really strange. Don't think it's strange. <laughs> How many of you find that when you're thrust into a trial that you didn't volunteer for, you usually think this is really strange? Your thinking is strange. Oh my, he's already insulted the people. It's strange to think that you will not have the word work in your life. I mean, think about it. Jesus, the number one expert on the words of Jesus and intent of Jesus, said you'll have tribulation. Paul, who had, I think he sported about 156 unique stripes on his body. Four times 40 lashes minus one. So in my simple uh, high school, night school math from Ashland, uh, that comes out to 156 stripes. He was in the deep. He suffered slander. He suffered betrayal. And, and, and you know, many people, one, one, one guy told me years ago, he said, man, if, if Paul had been walking more in the word, he could have confessed and not had any of those troubles. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches if you are going to move, if you want your tires to not wear out, park your car, in the garage, and in about eight years, you'll have to replace them from oxidation. But, you, but they will not look worn, but you'll not have movement. How many of you know that some people try to stay away from anything that could be problematic, demand faith, be a challenge, because I don't want to have that thump, thump, thump on my being. I think that we're told in the, in the scriptures that we're to live our life boldly and beautifully, and that there's a second part to this. Peter said this after verse 12 when he said, Don't think it's strange that you have a fiery trial, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So you've got to climb the mountain to see the view at the summit. You've got to, you've got to do life. You and I are living life in real time. This isn't a pretend life. This is your real life. And, 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 and it's, it's just, you know, pounding on. Unlike that fine work that Mr. Zach Jones did on the drums today. If I was his dad, I'd come and hear him, right? Oh, hi, Josh. Anyway, <laughs> how many of you know that, 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 that our, our heartbeat is, is pounding? An awareness that... Heartbeat, 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 heartbeat. Letting us know that we're mortal and we have one life to live and we do our best to live godly and to go ahead and say, I won't assign the trials, but when they come, I'm not gonna do crazy things like act like, hey, this is, this is, this is out of the ordinary. It's normal and God will take us through it and we can be a part of God's glory through it.
partaking of Christ's suffering. In the Songs of Ascent, we see similar themes of difficulty that is distressing and mixed with the problems and, and uncertainty. Or, excuse me, that uh, we see similar themes of difficulty that is distressing, but mixed with the problems and uncertainty is the hope of God's delivering power. Say, hope of God's delivering power. I, I hope on that all the time. So looking at these, these uh, uh, psalms, we're going to be handling psalms 129, 130, and 131. They're short. And uh, Natalie's down here along with Allie to give me a timer. So I can continue to preach and you all get to go home. But we see here in Psalm 129, the psalmist says this, Many a time they have afflicted me from my youth. Let Israel now say, many a time they have afflicted me from my youth. Hello, you're repeating. How do we know if you go through trauma, you do repeat? One of the gifts that I have is if you need to obsess about problems, I'm, I'm your huckleberry. Come into my office and we can spend a lot of time ob obsessing. That's how I process. Sometimes you just need a friend to talk to and go over it and over it. Have them pray with you. Hello? How many found that certain problems and tribulations in your life, even with all the good counsel, you're still obsessing? You don't have enough faith, brother. Sometimes it's not faith you need. Sometimes it's just a friend. Sometimes it's just a few days away from the problem. It takes time to grieve the loss of someone you love. There's a lot of different things in life that are road rash. And we as believers, we, we, we don't want to just brush people off. This psalmist is saying, hey, many a time they've afflicted me from my youth. Let Israel now say many a time they've afflicted me from my youth. What's the purpose of that? It's called coming out of denial and facing things as they really were. Yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed on my back. They made their furrows long. That's deep suffering. Could you imagine someone taking a plow? Have you ever seen a plow separate earth? <laughs> big rivets <laughs> right through it. A big furrow cut into the earth. And, and, and all these were agrarian people. And they're talking about the pain of having your back ripped, and ripped, ripped open by a plow. They made their furrows long. Then he brings in the Lord. The Lord is righteous. He has cut in pieces the cords of the wicked. Let all those who hate Zion be put to shame and turn back. Let them be as the grass on the housetops, which withers before it grows up, with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor he who binds sheaves his arms. Neither let those who pass by them say, The blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Wow. Talk about... A psalm of hope that also sounds like a psalm of reality that says, hey, man, I've been hurt. Some points that we're going to put up on, on the, some slides here. The, the first point is that affliction often starts in youth. Prepare. I'm, I'm very emotional about this when I think of little babies that are born and they're all beautiful aren't they? They look like salamanders when they're first born, but they grow out of it. <laughs> Women say, oh, that's beautiful. I always go, it looks like a newt or a salamander. Let, I'll be back in two months, and then I'll tell you how cute your baby is. And mean it. Now I'll just lie. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Looks just like your husband. <laughs> a more mature newt. You know what I'm saying? Children get hurt. Guillermo Prane, down in a uh, pastor in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, has a church they call the Children's Church, and he teaches spiritual warfare to little kids, teaches them to speak in tongues or leads them into speaking in tongue, taking authority. He said this, he said, children are abused, kidnapped, tortured. Why would we not arm them to defend themselves through the realm of the Spirit? And 
I think of little kids that mom and dad are suffering with their own self-worth and belittle the child from little on. The psalmist said, hey, this back-ripping suffering's been with me even since I was young. Well, you know, it happened once and goes away. No, it doesn't. There's stories of kids that were just beat mercilessly or molested, raped, tortured. And it can go on and on. Number two, affliction can be repetitive and frequent. Many times, this guy said, I was afflicted. But now the big statement, he said, yet they have not prevailed against me. I'm going to look you in the eye and tell you with all my heart, I'll go into battle with you and for you, but don't you run away from your own battle. Because if we go to war together, I'll, I'll lay my life down. I found many times that I've gone into mortal combat to defend someone and, and help them to overcome their past, and suddenly I find I'm all alone. You have got to choose, do you want to be a victim or do you want to be an overcomer? This guy said, yet. I was abused, but I... But, they have not prevailed against me. And how, and how did that happen? Because on the heels of that, he said, the Lord is righteous. He's cut to pieces. The Lord initiates the counterattack. Again, something that I'm really against, I'm against politically correct Christian statements. There's a lot of PC statements that you're supposed to make. Like, like, like when Jesus kicked over the, 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 the tables of the money changers, he could have had a brand new rookie that was his first day on a job, and his money gets thrown out, and you know he could have lost everything. So on that day, Jesus didn't look very Christ-like, did he? When he kicked over people's jobs, he's kicking their table and he's beating people with a whip. Oh, that can't be my Jesus. My Jesus is the gentle shepherd. Then you don't have a whole Bible Jesus. Because the same Jesus that's the gentle shepherd is going to come back as the lion of the tribe of Judah and the white horse rider. And he's not going to come suffering on a donkey. He's coming back on a white horse to slay the unrighteous. And we see here that in the Psalms, these people, they didn't leave, live in denial. Well, if I don't think about how I was abused in the past, if I don't think about it, I don't think about it, it's going to go away. No, it doesn't go away. It creates dry rot in your life. You've got to be able to know between right and wrong. You've got to be able to face the, the, and accuse with love. You treated me in a way that was really wrong. And you deserve to be thrown into hell for what you've done. And I'm not a victim of it. I'm not going to let that define me. But on the other hand, I'm not going to let us just have that quiet silence and act like nothing happened. Something happened. Let Israel say, I've been afflicted from my... Let Israel say. Why? Why do you want to repeat it? Because until you get what's right and you know what's up and what happened, you're not going to be able to understand the Lord's freedom and his deliverance. Oh dear, he got clo too close to the rhinoceros here. Okay. You guys with me? I'm talking about real time. And when I read the Psalms, wow. So real. And the Lord was helping. This guy had hope that he, he through the suffering, the prevailing didn't work. And that's what happens if you were molested or jilted at the altar or slandered, or abused, slapped around. There's a lot of ways that humans do some really bogus things to one another. And part of your freedom is to say, hey, that's not going to define me. Even like Joseph, what you guys meant for evil, the Lord turned it for good. Second Psalm we're looking at is Psalm 130. 
Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word do I, I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Very quickly, taking the, some bullet points from, from this psalm, Psalm 130. We often cry from depths. Have you ever noticed that you are a better prayer person when you're going through trouble? When things are really going good, yeah, Lord, thank you, church is good, Kim's good, kids are good, even George, he's good. And, and, uh, and, 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 and I'll spend a little bit more time with you later. When I'm going through a trial, a bad one, man, I'm talking to God all day long. Oh, Lord, I need strength today. Lord, you're good. Lord, you know, here I am. I'm crying out of the depths. The Lord has great hearing for people crying from the depths. Jonah said he was in the, in the belly of the whale, and he cried out to God and was heard. You know, Solomon was given this promise by God. When I take my people into deep captivity, or Moses was given this, and then Solomon prayed it in his prayer. When, when my people sin and they go into deep captivity, from a far land, I'll hear them and I'll bring them home. <laughs> Don't ever think that if you're in the depths that God isn't there to hear you. He, he, he loves phone calls from the depths. <laughs> They're more sincere. And, he, and the psalmist here said, I pray, God, that you, your ears would be attentive to my prayer. That's okay to pray that God would listen to you. I mean, you're the one trying to pray. Oh, Lord, I don't want to bother you, you know, but if you get around to it, you know, I've got some things we need to talk about. No, 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 say, me first. Because God can put you, God can answer prayers simultaneously all over the earth. This psalmist said, hey, let your ears be attentive to my prayer. Third point, God doesn't keep an ongoing record of our iniquities. Iniquities are different than, 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 than uh, sin in kind of a gen general way. Iniquities come from iniquitous roots, which means that, that every one of us since the fall, uh, every human is born not only with a God destiny, <laughs> but a flaw from the fall. Some people, it might be same-sex attraction. Some people, it might be towards violence. Some people, it might be towards lying to save face, pride. How many of you know that most of us, if we're honest, we know that thing, which is that besetting sin, that stumbler in our life? I know in church, it's like, can I just say the word Jesus? No, we're asking about you to think. I know my besetting sins. I know the, the iniquitous root. And if they're iniquitous roots, we've all exercised them. It's so beautiful. I have three amens. The good news, God doesn't keep an ongoing record of our iniquities. Even in the Old Testament, these guys had to be saved by faith righteousness. Abraham knew he, he was still short. Moses knew that, that just keeping the law wasn't enough. David knew. David wrote often about it. And I think for us to just understand this, we're not paying it forward. We're not, we're not trying to clean the balance sheet. If you've had one or more sins in your life, you've fully earned eternal rejection. When you come to Jesus, it will be because you want his free gift. And with it, he promises you that I will not keep a record of your iniquities. The, the fourth one in this slide is forgiveness comes from God, that he may be feared. See, a lot of people want to make sure that Aunt Lucy feels good about him. Well, you know, I want my Aunt Lucy to really respect me, or I want, you know, my cousin Tim to think I'm a, a good man, or I want my, uh, you know, uh, Aunt Linda to think I'm okay. You know, we need to quit playing to humans. 
and we need to start playing to God. He's the only source of forgiveness. So it didn't matter if everybody thinks that you are this or that or the other, but you go to the Lord, and, and, and being he's the only broker, then, then I, I tremble at his word. And I, I know this, my fear is God. Because, because someday I'm going to stand before him, and all the shocking and jiving isn't going to cut anything. He will either say, well done, good and faithful servant, or he'll tell me, depart, and I'll be cut a place with the hypocrites. Okay? That's the cold, hard reality of eternity. And so that's why we fear him. He's the source of forget, forgiveness. Sl slide, uh, the next slide, uh, bullet point. I'm personally invested in waiting on the Lord. You're, you're not really calling on God out of the depths if you're having everybody else outsource your prayer. Well, you know, my life's kind of a mess, and I think that Natalie ought to pray for me. Well, that's praying for me anyway, but maybe I'd get invested. Yeah. Sir, ma'am, don't, don't just outsource it to your, you know, your mate. They're, they're, they're closer to God. They need to pray about my need of repentance. No, they don't need to pray about that. You need to pray about it. The psalmist said I'm, that he was waiting on the Lord. Then the second point, waiting involves my soul, the invisible part of me. All that's in me gets locked up in seeking God and waiting on him. My mind, will, and emotions, the invisible part of me that can connect with God, needs to be invested in waiting on the Lord. The third thing, we don't just wait for some ambiguous answer. It says, in his word, do I hope? In the promises of God, do I hope? This is why, as long as I'm pastor, we'll have Pastor Steve's pizza party, which is an incentive to get you to get your little babies to read the Bible, and you to get your older body reading the Bible. We need a macro view every year, a macro view of what God said, because how can you cash in the promises that you don't even know are there? How many remember when you get like a recall on a part that your car had? I, 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 I had a pickup and, and, and the airbag. And so I, I drive in and they say, okay, that's, uh, you know, and the year. And boom, I get a new airbag because, because I was aware of the rebate. But you know what? They weren't going to stop me on the freeway. Hey, uh, you know, good buddy. I just want to let you know there's a rebate on that airbag. And the same thing happens. We, we are given the scriptures so we can hope in them. And we have to read the scriptures so we can come and say, hey, you said you're a healer of our body. I read it in Matthew 8. I read it in Isaiah 53. Lord, you healed all that came to you, Lord. You're a healer. And I have an affliction and I need lupus gone or I need diabetes gone or I need blindness, lack of hearing. Or deafness would be another way to say it. Then finally on this one, my soul waits more closely for the Lord than a watchman for the morning. Wow. The watchman given the whole charge of the city had to be very alert. The psalmist here said, hey, man, I was even more alert. I was waiting to hear from God with my need. Slide, uh, or slide six. Three reasons for Israel or believers to wait on the Lord. Number one, with the Lord, there is mercy. Number two, with him is abundant redemption. <laughs> he wants to pour it out on you. And number three, he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Wow, who qualifies for this prayer? Um, you and I. Do you want to do a test to make sure that you qualify? Can you fog a mirror? Can you go up and go, <sighs> and there's like, moisture there, you're alive. God wants to hear your prayer. This morning already we had a, had a young man give his heart to the Lord from another country from a whole different faith. And it was beautiful to see his hand and, and raise up. Wow. Awesome. God is abundant in mercy. And 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 He'll redeem Israel from all his iniquities, which means all that iniquity in my life, those things that I've said, Lord, Lord, help me, help me. Help me, God, I'm an, an idiot. Why do I keep failing in this area? He's saying, hey, little buddy, we're going to get there. 
I'm not going to leave you overrun with iniquity. I don't know about you. I'm kind of ready to like sit down and listen a while. This gives me hope. He's not going to leave us there. Finally, the last psalm is quite short. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. This, honestly, is one of my go-to chapters when I'm in deep trouble. How many have ever had so much trouble in your life that you didn't even know where to start? And I found that you can bring your whole pickup load and just go, God, I don't know how to pray. The Bible tells us in Romans 8 that we can actually pray. Holy Spirit will pray within us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, no one could really imitate him. God, God. Does this prayer sound familiar? Does this sound like your prayer? God, 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 God. Okay, that's just one minute's worth. And the next hour, it's still there. We wait on God. Four keys to approaching God in prayer. Number one, a heart that isn't haughty. God's not impressed with haughtiness. You know, God, you're kind of lucky to have me. You've not seen a gift like my banjo gift. I can play banjo better than Steve Martin. Got it? It's like, oh, ho, hum, Holy Spirit, this is boring. Haughtiness. This psalmist said, my heart isn't haughty, eyes that aren't lofty. Yeah, well, you know, I'm I'm all that in a bag of chips. Yep. I'm here to talk to you, Lord. Nope. Get back in line. The psalmist said, I'm not concerning myself with great matters that, that we can't fix. Can I just say this? Oregon, California, Washington, we need help. Well, you know, we just need to do this and that. You know, no, we don't need to do, do just this and that. Because if God doesn't move on the hearts of the inhabitants of our states, you can try to put on Band-Aids. We need revival in the West Coast. We need a God move in the West Coast. And so there are some things that I go, people ask me, well, what do you think about this? That I don't know yet. Maybe if I get an opinion, a strong opinion, I might talk to you. Maybe not. Because even if I think I might know, it's probably not going to be. And why will I shorten my quality of life by fretting over things that I am not directly involved in changing? I vote, okay? And I, and I do my best, you know, to be an upright stand-up guy. I've served in different boards, even in the city and, 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 and races. But I will tell you this, that there are some matters, they're just, they're just above our pay grade. Let it be. And so uh, the fourth one here is not stressing over things you don't understand. So how do we wait on God successfully? Next slide. Calm and quiet your soul. People get in panic. You know, I've had people, and I'm going to pray for them down here, and then they like, they start speaking in tongues. They're speaking in tongues like, oh my gosh, lay hands on me with all that juice. And I ask them, if you got all that power flowing, what are you asking me to pray? Well, I don't. I, you know, so what, you're, you're, you're speaking in tongues at a rapid rate because you're just, you're, you're freaking out. But, but I want to pray for you in faith. So I'll probably just pray in English, but expecting something to be done. Is that, is that Okay. Not that I don't love your tongues. This isn't the time to yell in tongues with all your might while someone's trying to pray for you. Okay, This is primarily for Pentecostal people. If you're not Pentecostal here, don't feel out of the game. It's, it's cool. This is an incentive to speak in tongues. It probably sounds like less than that. But how many have had people that when, when you pray for them, and 
Jesus used to kick people out of the room. You're not helping. You're walking in when we actually have an answer and you're coming in and binding the good stuff because of your unbelief. So oftentimes he'd take Peter and John and, 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 and they'd walk in and, and they would affect a healing or a miracle. And so part of helping somebody is get them to take their jet pack off their, their skates. God is going to help you. Calm down. And that's what this guy said. He said, I've calmed and quieted my soul. How? How do we do it? Like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. If you live your life with a dependency on the grace of God to help you, then when you feel your heart palpitating and I just need to fix it and we need to do something, we need to leave Medford. Well, where are you going to go? Where there's no trouble, you know, Portland. Eh. <laughs> Newsflash. Do you see how many possums get run over in Portland? You don't need to be walking across the crosswalks in distress in Portland. So Natalie has a little one, little Wesley. And there are times when he's fussing and he needs a nap. And so she'll kind of capture his head. No, this mama loves you. And all of a sudden, he begins to quit panting. And then he falls asleep. And when he wakes up, he finds there's plenty of food. The same people that always loved him are there. There are times we need to go to bed with the Lord. God, I want to leave my troubles. I just want to go to sleep and wake up in your peace. I want to conclude this by reading the last verse. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. From this time forth and forever. Oh, believer, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. Siempre, always. The Holy Spirit's moving to just do a work right now in our hearts. How many of you can say with me that, like myself, at times we panic and we want to do frenetic, crazy actions? But when we just take off our jetpack, we find the Lord has a plan. Every week, as we preach and we offer our prayers and our praise to God, so many people come into this place and they think. Put their hope in the Lord. So far this year, we've had over 500 people come to Jesus. People that are just saying, hey, I've tried all the other things out there. Does Father God really love me? Other people walked out of my life. I wonder what it'd be like to, if I did not know Jesus and I walked in and I wondered, is religion going to be another scam? I think many people don't come to church because they're afraid. They want to know God, but they're so afraid. It's going to be gimmicky, like so many other things that promise you something and they overpromise and underdeliver. And if I didn't know Jesus, I might be scared until I met someone that I could find real sincerity in. And then I'd go to church. And then when I'd feel the presence of God and hear his words, and I'd realize I'm not abandoned. I was created to know this guy, the living God. And that he's made all the preparation for me to know him. He sent his son Jesus to be a human 
among us. He was fully human, fully God. The Son of God came, lived perfectly, and faced the cross to pay for the sins of the world so that whoever would believe on Jesus could be free of those sins as a, as a receipt of payment received and accepted. Jesus raised from the dead in three days. God was saying, yep, that's the payment. It's been received. And whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How many of you believers say, man, I want to get saved again. It's just so good. I just, I love it. I love it. So right now, I'd like us all to bow our head and close our eyes. And I'm talking to all of you that came here. And maybe you've found that at times you were left holding the bag and you're all alone. And maybe you were the one that felt affliction, even from a youth. But you want to join God because you found out here today and other maybe encounters that God has done everything to join you. God has come to you through the person of Jesus. He's paid in full for your sins. Every one of you that are in this place and you would like to join God today, you would like to become a believer in Jesus, I want you to raise your hand so I can see. And we just want to, we're not going to ask you to get up and do anything, but just lift up your hand right now. You're here and you say, I want God. I want to join God. I see a hand right there. There's a couple of hands so far. Come on, get your hands up. Today's a good day. See another hand there? Hallelujah. Today's a good day to receive the Lord. Good day to receive the Lord. With him is abundant redemption, and he'll forgive all your iniquities. We're going to pray a prayer right now. It's a prayer to just invite the Lord to save us. And all of you that raised your hand, pray this prayer with me. And all of you who've already prayed this prayer, pray it again because I think it's awesome that we always remind ourselves of how great a salvation we have. Could we all pray this? Dear Father, I thank you that you will not leave me as an orphan, but you have come to me in the person of Jesus Christ. You sent Jesus to live the perfect life, to bear my sins and the sins of the world upon himself. I thank you, God, that you raised Jesus from the dead, signifying the payment of sin was effective. And I'm asking right now, forgive me of my sins. Lord, you've done everything to join me, and I want to join you. Save me, God. You said if I would call on your name, that I would be saved. You also said in your scripture that whoever would call on his name would not be ashamed. Take away the shame from my life. Lord, I pray that you would completely forgive me of all my sins and iniquities. If you'll be my God, I'll be your servant. If you'll be my father, I'll be your child. I receive you today, dear father. In Jesus' name, amen.